Good afternoon or evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Nina Ha, and I'm the director of the Asian Cultural Engagement um, Center. And I would like to invite you to our um, now annual APEED Alumni Society Career um, Career Hour. Um, and for this, um, the theme for this year's APEDAM, APEDAM standing for Asian Pacific Islander Daisy American Heritage Month, is making the invisible visible. So before we begin, I would like to share the Virginia Tech um, Land and Labor Acknowledgement. Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit materials com Material commitments uh, falls short of our institutional responsibilities through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudela and Monacan peoples and other Native nations. We commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved pe Black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Pusum that I may serve in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So without further ado, I would like to introduce um, Jack, Jackie Marmel, who is the chair of the APEED Alumni Society. Jackie. Thank you, Dr. Ha. So good evening to everyone, uh, or whenever you're watching this, my name is Jackie Marmel. I am the chair of APEDAS, which stands for, and this is a mouthful, Asian Pacific Islander Daisy American Alumni Society. It is a newly formed alumni association that's dedicated to bringing Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders together. Because as you all know, you know, once a Hokie, always a Hokie. So even after you graduate, there is a community to welcome you with open arms. And so this is actually our second year doing this career panel. I'm very excited to introduce the panelists that we have to talk about their experience and to provide to provide some tips and tricks on how to navigate the post-grad world. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so we're going, I'm gonna start with introducing Ms. Malido. She is my vice chair of APITAS. She is the class of 2020 and she is currently a marketing specialist at ICF. Next we have Yang Deeple, uh, class of 2018 and she's a human resources generalist at Upstack. And finally, we have Elaine Consolation, class of 2021, and she's an engineer at Grundley Construction. So we're, we've got the introductions, but we're gonna get to know a little bit more about our panelists and their experiences. Um, so I'm gonna go dive into the first question, um, which is just a little bit about you. You know, So if y'all would like to share your background and how you ended up at Virginia Tech, um, if anyone would like to get started or else I can call on someone. Anyone? I can go first. I don't mind. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, yeah, no problem. Okay, so I'm Melanie. Hello. Nice to meet everyone. Um, so just a bit about myself. Um, Jackie already said, but I am the class of 2020. So um, I am, I think, a pretty recent grad, if you ask me. Um, I also majored in public relations and technical writing with a minor in leadership and social change. So I was pretty um, involved with the, um, I don't think they're called the residential leadership community anymore. I think they're called the leadership and social, social change residential college. And um, they're, I think when I was in school, they were, um, when I was a freshman and a sophomore, I, I stayed in um, Payne Hall, but I think now they're in Oshag uh, or, or Shaughnessy, excuse me. Um, and it's now all nicely rebuilt and renovated. And I don't blame y'all if you guys want to like live there. So makes sense. And then um, how I ended up at Virginia Tech though. So uh, when I was a senior at um, 
Woodson High School. I'm from Northern Virginia, along with a lot of other Asian Americans from our school. Um, I was in between Virginia Tech and VCU, actually Virginia Commonwealth University. And the reason I was between those two is because Virginia Tech, um, I just heard so much about alumni that would come back. And I will admit, like a lot of my alumni friends are like, you know, Asian Americans as well. And compared to other schools, because I even applied to UVA as well. <clears throat> I know, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I applied to UVA as well, the University of Virginia. And um, I don't know, I was just between all the three of these schools because um, what drew me into Virginia Tech specifically, so actually let me start with, so University of Virginia, if I was going to go there, I was going to apply to their College of Kinesiology, and then if I was going to go to VCU, I was going to do their like College of, like basically their major in um, uh, pre, uh, pre physical therapy. I think was what I was kind of going towards, but then at Virginia Tech, they don't, they didn't have these healthcare professions specifically. So I thought like what at Virginia Tech could I do? And so I decided to do public relations because I've always been, I guess a type of people person, especially in high school. And so I was like, okay, wow, these three majors, very different, right? And so just deciding, I guess, the culture of each school. So I had friends from UVA, I had friends from BCU, but none of them really ever went back to their alma maters. And I, I wondered why, right? Versus Virginia Tech, like all these Hokies are always talking about like, oh yeah, I'm going back for a football game. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going back for, you know, alumni reunion. And I'm like, why, like, why, like, why do you care? And it's the furthest from Virginia to, or from Northern Virginia as well, right? And so I was like, why are they doing this? And then I just realized like the Hokie spirit, the Hokie, the community basically, like it's unlike any other. And like, I really wanted that for my college experience um, for the four years I was in undergrad. And that is why I picked Virginia Tech and I don't regret it at all. So that's how I ended up at Virginia Tech. <laughs> Thanks. Should I pass it? Should I popcorn? Or does anyone else want to get you like? <laughs> anyone else want to go? Or I can popcorn you. I can popcorn my girl Yang. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Melanie. Um, so my name is Yang, and I'm a first generation, I'd say, I should say student, but probably alum now is a better term. Um, I'm also Vietnamese American, born and raised, as Melanie was mentioning earlier, in Northern Virginia, as for a lot of the Asian American student population typically resides from. Um, I studied communications and international studies, and honestly, going into Virginia Tech, I didn't have an idea of what major I wanted to do. I think Jackie and I were in the same boat. We kind of went in freshman year kind of just like, okay, well, we know we wanted to go to college and it was kind of like university studies. And we we're like, by sometime, I think sophomore year, spring semester, you have to decide by then. So we, I remember us having conversations of going back and forth of like, which major we were deciding between. And I eventually ended up with communications and international studies just because communications, because I wanted something that was flexible and I can mold into a, any kind of career path and international studies, just because I had like credits from high school that I wanted to use. And I was just like, I might as well just um, do that. Um, Fun fact, when Melanie mentioned OSHAG, I lived in OSHAG before it got renovated. So everyone here who has gotten to see the glory of the new OSHAG, I'm very jealous. Um, this, I was literally like, I'm, yeah, it was, it was a rough time. Um, I graduated in 2018, so I think it's been a solid four years now, um, which is crazy to think because now I've been out of college for the same amount of time that I was in college. So even when I was looking through the questions for this panel, I was kind of racking my brain of like, what was my college experience like? I had to go back on photos and things and just talk to friends and memories. Um, well, how I ended up at Virginia Tech is at Virginia Tech, they have a fall visitation program. And I actually heard about it from a college counselor in high school. And coming from like the social economic background um, that I do come from, like, and as I mentioned earlier, as a first generation student, the program is specifically designed for um, students who are from underrepresented backgrounds or even first generation students. And pretty much I just apply before going and just wanted to take advantage of any opportunities that were given to me. So that's pretty much what I did. And also VC was also my second choice. So I was debating, debating between a city school versus kind of like a rural school. And I think I was kind of afraid, but then um, after just going to campus, all the visitation changed my mind. Like, I think just everyone's, how welcoming everyone was and just seeing the community itself. I think that's what attracted me most to tech. Plus um, they <laughs> offered me scholarship money. So I can't say no to that. Um, yeah, with that, I will popcorn to Elaine. Hello, again, my name is Elaine. Nice to meet you all, or I guess kind of meet you all. Um, so how I ended up at Virginia Tech, 
Um, I'm Filipina American, originally from Virginia Beach. Um, I'm technically, I, okay, I don't really know how it works. It's not really clear. It's like I'm either second or third generation Filipina American. So my dad and my uncle actually went to Virginia Tech and they studied mechanical engineering. So I'd say like pretty early on in my childhood, engineering was pretty pushed <laughs> onto me, um, but I ended up liking it enough. I have other passions, but I, I do like engineering enough. And um, uh, really though, Virginia Tech, I would say is my was my own choice, even though I guess, I don't, I think it's called a legacy student, right? Yeah, even though I'm technically a leg legacy student. Um, I think like it was my first visit in my junior year of high school. I literally fell in love with the campus um, because I guess, I don't know, I wouldn't really consider Virginia Beach like a, a very urban city environment, even though it's big enough to be called a city. Um, so I liked the contrast of the beach and then the mountains. So I think that was like something that drew me to towards Virginia Tech. Um, and there were other cons too, like, I mean, other pros, oh my God, I'm so tired. Other pro, there are other pros too, um, like the engineering opportunities because um, Virginia Tech is very much known for its engineering. And, um, and also like, uh, since I guess my family, my nuclear, is a nuclear family is based in Virginia Beach. Um, I really wanted that opportunity to be away from home and like really experience that. So this was like Virginia Tech was my first chance of getting that. So yeah, that's how I ended up there. <laughs> Thank you. And I just wanted to quickly add in that um, I was laughing uh, when Yang was talking about, you know, like I, cause I had, we went to the same high school. So I remember uh, a lot of people were already doing early decision to Virginia Tech and other schools, and then March had rolled around, and I also did not visit Tech's campus beforehand. I really just took a chance with it, but I saw my friends, like, yay, like, accepting and committing to Virginia Tech, and I was like, I need to make a decision, and, um, you know, sometimes when you take a gamble, it pays off very well. Um, what I recommend is to everyone, absolutely not. Maybe do more research than I had. Go visit a few campuses. I have a niece who's 16 years old and we're already planning a few visits, including Virginia Tech. So I'm trying to rectify what mistakes I made when I was her age. But I will say sometimes when you take a risk, it does pay handsomely. And this is coming from someone who's risk averse. Uh, so, um, but I appreciate y'all, you know, kind of, talking more about how you ended up at, at Virginia Tech because it seems like we all had you know some similarities but really coming from unique different paths and we all ended up in the same place around the same time. <laughs> sure and hey sometimes the best surprises are you know like literally you're surprising yourself like when you get there like literally oh. you don't even know like when you're a freshman you literally don't even know where anything is and it's just like sometimes it's the best part of it you know it's discovering it then you make friends along the way that don't know it as well and so it's part it's all part well, of the I think, experience <laughs> I think it hit me once I lost cell service an hour down on I-81 so uh <laughs> but um anywho so you know um we're talking, we're already, already reminiscing about our time in Blacksburg and as students. So I would like to ask, you know, what was your experience like as an Asian American student at Virginia Tech? You know, did you feel like your identities, and I'm going to put a plural, because um, you do have multiple identities, um, do you feel like it impacted your experiences? And if so, how? So I know that's a big one, but um, I can share a little bit and then, you know, I can, you know, someone can take it next. But for me, um, similar, but more impactful than the loss of cell service on 81, uh, coming to Virginia Tech and realizing that I am at a predominantly white institution that was, and it's very different coming from, and as some of you are familiar with Northern Virginia, it's very, very different. It's night and day coming from a suburban to urban area to a very rural area. 
very different. And also for many of us, it's the first time being so far away from your parents and, you know, uh, being away from even like your support system. Cause like you leave your friends from high school, you leave your cousins, uh, siblings, whomever's your support system, you leave them, you come to the school. And I think um, being, a, uh, being an Asian American at Tech made me, it, it forced me to confront my, my identity because I wasn't white enough to assimilate, but I wasn't, I also felt like I wasn't Asian enough in some aspects when I was mingling with other Asian and Asian American students. And through that is how I found, you know, space in activism. And that's how I got involved with the different organizations and clubs that I was in. Um, so it was hard at first, for sure. But, you know, enough about me. I want to hear about y'all and I know everyone else wants to hear about y'all. So does anyone want to jump in and talk about it? I do, um, yeah. <laughs> especially since I, uh, Jackie and I went to middle school and high school together. So I'd say our school system specifically, I would say in the Falls Church area is very diverse. We had a very high population of like Latin, it was literally from like Latinx students to Asian students to white students. So going to Virginia Tech for me was like a culture shock because it was the first time ever in my life I was like the only Asian girl in my class. And there was moments where I sat in class, especially for Melanie and my, our majors, it's like work in communications. Like literally that is the, pre, a lot of the Asian student populations typically is geared towards STEM. So it was kind of like, I would like to say I'm more of like an ambivert. So I, I was just like hesitant to read, like to make friends with people just cause like I, it was just new to me and I was just nervous. So definitely would say that Jack, I definitely relate to you when you mentioned that coming to tech made you face your identity. I think overall, like in the past, I've always, in high school, middle school, I've always felt really proud of like being like Vietnamese, being Asian in general. But I remember like moments that I faced going from middle school to high school to even college, every time I try to speak Vietnamese with any of like my like friends or like, so, and peers and like BSA and so on, sometimes people would be like, ew, why are you speaking Vietnamese? Like you're such a fob. And I'm just kind of like, oh, like this is interesting. Cause I'm like, I thought we're supposed to, embrace the, our culture and like this is like what this so I think it just also made me realize how our like within our, even our own community how internalized it is and I think this conversation didn't start happening until more of like after college I kind of wish like this was a bigger conversation when we were in college but I'm glad it's at least happening better late than never is my main thing um I didn't feel honestly when I my mom dropped me off I cried because <laughs> I was just like I had friends from high school there but I like still cried because like I'm an only child I am like attached to the hip with my parents growing up so I think it was like just the first time being away from home that far away and just not having like it's fun and exciting but also so scary so I didn't feel really at home until I joined like my first organization I joined was VSA and then later sophomore year I joined um PASA so I definitely felt more at home once I got a big and once like I felt like I had a community around me and like just people who are who can share the same like feeling that I felt I met like there was a lot of emphasis in college of um, your freshman class of like your class that you go through um, each Asian org with. And I definitely felt that bond with my class. And I think that really helped me talk about my experiences and find people within my community and just continue like friends that I made, they are still friends that I have now. Some old, but like four years later. And I, sometimes we talk about it now we're like, we met when we were like 18 and now we're like, now we're like 26 getting off of our parents insurance. Like it's kind of cool to feel that. So. Overall, at the end of the day, I think college or being at Virginia Tech helps me be more proud of being Asian and helped me be gain a lot of friendships. And overall, just yeah, overall, what you just said, Jackie, of just embracing who I am, and all that, all that jazz. So yeah, everyone's gonna. Ask. I love that. Also, Dr. Hodge just chimed in saying, "We're all so young." <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hodge. I needed the I needed the recording to catch that one. Um. Did anyone else want to chime in about their experiences? I can go actually. So I'm, I'm just going to go off of Yang because we had a similar experience. So um, actually coming from Northern Virginia. So I didn't go to Falls Church or um, I would say other schools like that, or like maybe Jeff Stewart or like, you know, Annadale. So I went to Woodson and Woodson was in the same, I think like when it came, came to like socioeconomic or even like even sports, like leagues wise, we were more with like Langley, McLean. Um, so like Tyson's, if you guys are, um, if you guys are familiar with that area, it's a little, 
um, I think more uh, affluent, I would say. And so um, I did go to a school with a lot of white people. And um, so coming to tech, I, I wasn't, it wasn't like crazy. Uh, it wasn't a crazy change for me, but then I will admit it was different because um, all the orgs that I joined um, that um, weren't Asian American, I guess, um, mainly Asian American like students, like I always felt like maybe like, am I the token Asian kid? You know what I mean? Like, oh, like if ever they need something for our diversity and inclusion, like, oh, Melanie, do you mind doing the tour for like this, this girl coming in? You know what I mean? And so that I would be like, yes, I get it. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, and, eat, and I would admit if I was taking a tour, I would want someone that looks like me that like can, I can relate to as well. But um, I, you know, you just, cause sometimes you have to you question it, right? And I know they have very good intentions, don't get me wrong, but obviously that's a whole nother issue. Um, but I will say going into Virginia Tech, um, being an Asian American woman, um, I always knew about VSA, the Vietnamese Student Association growing up because um, I'm very close to my dad and my mom's side. So um, my dad's side is Vietnamese, my mom's side is Chinese. And so going into uh, going to Virginia, Virginia Tech, I was like, oh, which org should I join? And I, I literally joined all of them my freshman year. But as you get older and like as you go through I guess the four years of college like you will realize like which orgs you're more involved in and that's completely fine it's just your personality and who you are so um going in my freshman year I knew I wanted to join BSA and I think Yang I think you were the events coordinator that year <laughs> and like honestly no she had good events or, or else I wouldn't have gone out that, that often right so <laughs> So no, it was honestly really eye opening and it was cool because I got to experience and see other Asian Americans as well. I think some of them are still my friends even to this day because um, I did move back home saving money. I hope you guys all do too. But um, <laughs> literally, I have friends from Virginia Tech that also graduated with me. Um, and then what was nice was my cousins actually went to Virginia Tech with me. I had um, two other cousins that were at Tech while I was at Tech. And um, that really helped a lot too. So whenever I missed home, like, you know, I would go to them and be like, hey, like, does anyone have leftovers from home? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like usually my, you know, one of my guy cousins would be like, yeah, dude, my mom like packed all this frozen stuff for me and, you know, just things like that. So there was like that homey feeling as well that I was, I guess, very fortunate to have. Um, but yeah, like honestly, being an Asian American woman, um, it was cool um, to obviously represent, I guess, my community whenever I needed to, but also at the same time, like still feel included um, with how ma however many orgs that I was in and whatnot. So, yeah. Thank you. Elaine, would you like to talk a little bit about, do you want to touch on this question or? Yes, of course. <laughs> um, I'd say like, I guess my experience was a little different growing up because Virginia Beach, um, I guess like in, in my area growing up, there were a lot of minorities, but still not a lot of Asians. Um, and so going into high school, middle school, like elementary school, I was, I was already used to being the only Asian kid or only Asian girl, like in my classes. Um, so going into tech, I wasn't, I wasn't that culture shocked. It was just more like, um, I guess, like what Jackie was saying, having to face um, the fact that I, I am a minority a little bit more. Like I was being a little more honest with myself um, because growing up, I think it was more like, you know, um, kind of like a childish way of seeing yourself. Um, it's like, oh yeah, I'm Filipino. And it was, uh, that's all I had to say about it. <laughs> um, we didn't get, I didn't get more nuanced um, or like I didn't understand that I was going through an identity crisis um, like until showing up to college and like coming to, to talks like this and hearing um, uh, like Jackie was one of the first people I've met, um, I guess like in the Asian American community. So like hearing and seeing someone talk about these things um that definitely was the start of me wanting to be more involved and in making more friends that I could relate to in that aspect so yeah thank you I appreciate it and I just want those who are participating in this panel now and who will be watching this later that as an 
Asian American, Pacific Islander student, whatever experiences you are going through right now or have encountered in the past, there are a lot of alums who've come before you who have that exact feeling. Sometimes it's wonderful, sometimes not so much, but I want to further validate your feelings and experiences because we're, you know, sitting in front of our webcams right now <laughs> telling you exactly what we went through. And is it hard? Absolutely. But uh, I think this also stresses the importance of community. And, you know, we are all, we were all connected together and we're all still connected together at some point. And it helps to have that other person that you can lean on, especially um, just college in general is stressful enough as it is having to tack on the other stresses of being a minority, like being Asian American, being a woman, being first gen, um, middle to low income, so on and so forth, our multiple identities, adding those, um, those extra burdens that we didn't exactly foresee until we got there. So I think it's important. Um, and I appreciate y'all, you know, really elaborating on your experiences. So whoever is watching, know that you are not alone. It is a process, but you know, that's why it's so important for our community to come together to support the students that are there now, especially that we're in. Um, getting off my soapbox now. So, you know, eventually we all had to graduate, but those come with, it comes with the questions of, so what are you doing next? Are you going to grad school? Like, where are you working? Who are you working for? What's the pay? You know, if they're bold enough to ask that, which we should talk about too more often, but that's a different discussion. Um, so I'm curious and I'd like to know um, from all of y'all, like what was your journey, you know, getting to the career or the job that you're at now? And what was it like experience, like what was your experience like navigating the job search? I know um, a lot of people are familiar with all of the, um, the uh, job fairs that would come around, especially Business Horizons. And I didn't even participate in the, in the STEM ones. I wasn't a STEM major at Tech, but you knew it was, uh, you knew it was um, job, it was job fair time, especially when everyone was sharing their portfolios and dumping their backpacks in the A Center or the nearest ballroom. And, heading straight upstairs, running like a, yep, I remember, we don't, I don't need to go into the nitty gritty, but um, I am curious to hear from all of y'all, like what was your experience navigating all of that, trying to figure out what were your next steps post-grad? That was also yeah. a loaded one, I apologize. <laughs> You're good, no, no, no. I have, right, I knew right away what to say. So um, being a communications major, major uh, Yang might've had a little different experience than me, but uh, coming from communications, there was no liberal arts um, career fair. <laughs> I, like to say. I think they're working on it now, which is really good. And like, obviously, I, I've actually gotten a couple of emails from the College of Communications, um, like trying to, you know, ask for alumni with advice and please come back for whatever job help. Um, but when I was in school, there wasn't really a specific job fair um, for liberal arts majors. And so that was hard. Um, everything was geared towards STEM, especially Engineering Expo. And then Business Horizons was the big one, I think, in the early spring. I think that's when it would be. Engineering Expo was usually in, in fall. Um, but I, being a communications major, I still went to all of them. Um, I know some people will say it's crazy. Like, what, what are you doing here? Right. And so the reason why I went is because I knew I stood out, like, because I was like kind of a, like, like a needle in the haystack, but also at the same time, like the one, like the one red ball in the, the pile of green balls or something, you know what I mean? Like, what, what am I doing here? And so I remember I would, you know, print all my resumes, dress up just like every, everyone else. I would go up to the tables, do my research um, beforehand and obviously go up to these I guess recruiters and just tell them like, hi, I had my whole elevator pitch. Hi, I'm Melanie. I'm not an engineering major, but I am a communications major and I know you know people in whatever the communication department, marketing department or whatever. And honestly, just putting myself out there because um, that's what you got to do. If you don't put yourself out there, no one's going to know who you are and you have to want the job. You have to want the internships and things like that. And so I did that from the get-go freshman year. Um, and my freshman year, I actually got an internship um, out of 
like out of nowhere. So it's like, I think it was like spring 20, oh my gosh, spring 2017 or something. And it was obviously a very humbling experience, but it was also just very, like, I was very grateful because as a freshman, not many people do have like internships. And so, um, yeah, when you got to do that, you got to do what you got to do. Right. And so that's what I did. And I did that for every single year that I went, even as a freshman, I know people always say as a freshman, there's no reason to go, but I think I'm glad I went just to get the experience of talking to people and these are recruiters and like I I think it's good to go earlier even if you're not going to get anything just to have that experience so you aren't nervous when you know your junior senior year comes up and you have no idea you're fumbling your elevator pitch and things like that so I highly recommend going um and when you're unique I guess like me out of all these other engineering students um hopefully you can put yourself out there and I also would say that even though I knew the recruiter was there looking for other engineering you know, people on the team or business, you know, consulting people, um, they would at least, or I would just ask like, hey, like, even if you aren't going to take me on your team, do you know anyone maybe that might be hiring in your communications department, in your marketing department? And they're like, I actually am pretty close to blah, blah, blah. Like, give me your resume. I'll send your resume to them. Um, do you know what I mean? So just, like you said, putting yourself out there or else will never, it'll never happen. So, and then always send your thank you emails. So, yes. That's uh, how I got to uh, where I am now as a marketing specialist at ICF. Um, and I was a COVID um, student as well. So class of 2020, we didn't have a graduation. We didn't have um, a lot of stuff, but um, I remember getting an offer of my, what is it? Like right before school ended basically. And then it, you know, it got pushed back and pushed back as a COVID. Um, and then eventually you just have to find a new job. And I, I kept applying for other places just in case, because um, I guess you can't, you can't guarantee that that one job will always be there for you. You know what I mean? So um, I was still applying to other places and that's where I ended up. So yeah, here I am. <laughs> Anyone else want to go? I guess I'll go next. <laughs> um, so I'd say like it was really hard to get that first chance because, uh, yeah, like as a freshman, it is a lot more intimidating to try and talk to recruiters um, at these events or like really try to want that one on one time with a recruiter as well. Um, so yeah, what Melanie was saying, like putting yourself out there and like really trying um, to to get that was that that was the hardest part, I believe. And um, but I especially because I'm actually a, a, I think it's pretty obvious I'm an introvert, and I'd say yeah, like it took a lot for me to do to like get myself to even apply to a job because I was like, oh, they're not gonna take me anyway. And it's like, no, you, sh you should definitely apply just to like get into the rhythm of it. And um, you never know, you like, they might get, you might get an interview out of it. Like I, I'd i say like a lot of the times when I was granted an interview, it was definitely me applying just to see what would happen. Um, so I, I think it's worth it. <laughs> um, I'd say that's what ended up happening with like, with how I got the job that I'm in now it was because like oh I met someone I liked at a recruiting thing and then I just decided to like keep talking to her because she was really nice and now she's my boss like my direct supervisor so um I'd say thanks I'd say that's like how it ended it up it ended up oh I stuttered there um but yeah so I'd say like definitely just taking the chance like yes plan accordingly of course but um I think like taking the chances is, is like how that was, I'd say that was like my motto for navigating through this, like the job search and all that. But yeah, I hope I answered the question fully. Yeah. Yes, to both. Um, I would like to say I'm probably in the middle of Melanie and Elaine. I'd say I wasn't as brave as Melanie to really put myself out there. I went to like one or two career fairs and I was after that I was just like ah, can't do this anymore but as someone who did do recruiting and did have to go to a couple like or actually one career fair before COVID hit they as a recruiter I can definitely say like they do take resumes even like even if it's not within that same major just just send it out and people know people and they'll people always are like are looking for interns just always 
do your best to put yourself out there. And if you don't want to do it in person, definitely via email, phone call if you want, preferably email, just feel free to continue just following up. The main thing is always to follow up. And I'll also echo what Melanie said, like just thank you letters. I think a lot of times, I think recruiters are swept under the rug and no one really like appreciates all of like the, the fact that they have to be the middle person and talk between like the candidate and the hiring manager. So it, they, recruiters also do get a say of, not a say of like, if you get hired, but they can at least put in a good word for you, um, which I have done for candidates at my previous company. So I would like to say my journey to get to, to the position I am in now is a whole character development arc. As, as I mentioned earlier, I already struggled with picking a major Figuring out what I wanted to do as a job was so hard for me. There was a senior, well, there was someone a grade above me who was in the same major as I was. And I tried to follow her steps as being in marketing. Cause I'm like, oh, like she has the same majors as me. Um, and she's really involved in the community. Like I, maybe I should just follow her path. But then after doing a marketing internship right after college, I realized it wasn't for me. <laughs> um, I realized like, I, it just wasn't for me. And I think it just, I had to really learn the hard way of like, it's okay to really forge my own path, however I see fit. And also like, it was really hard to compare myself with other um, people in my class because everybody was getting job offers from really big name companies. And it was really hard to compare like, as everyone's getting their like acceptance letters or not acceptance letters, but like offer letters and so on. Um, really exciting time. Like e even when I really want to be happy for my friends, I just felt like I was putting myself down because I felt like, oh, my parents really wanted me to go to college and now I'm at the final end and I'm like, don't even know what to do next. And I had, I made like a whole Instagram post about it. And, and what was nice that was that I still follow my teachers from high school and, and middle school and cheer coaches and so on. And a lot of them were saying, hey, like I'm in my like X amount of like this decade of my life now and trust me, no one knows what they're doing. So I think that's, that helped me figure it out. And I, I learned to just pretty much embrace the journey. So marketing internship, I worked um, part-time at Lady M, if anyone's familiar, that cake shop in McLean, um, Tyson's Galleria. I worked there until then in 2019. And when I was working there, I was just like, oh, it was like shifts after shifts after shifts, interviews in the closet during my break and just kept like putting myself out there. I applied to at least two, 200, 300 jobs from like senior year until like I got like, graduated because I was just like trying to put myself out there. But it was hard because like a lot of entry-level jobs nowadays are like, yeah, you must have two to three years of experience. I just got out of college. Like, where is this experience going to be coming from? Like, or how am I supposed to get this experience if you won't even give me a chance? But I got really lucky with my first job as a recruiting coordinator at a tech startup in DC, DC called Quorum. So they really took a chance on me and just like, I just, I just told them like, I'm just looking for a company where I want to grow and learn and just figure out like what I want to do. So that's how I ended up within HR and into my role now. And I would say like, advice that I would give to everyone looking for a job, but they're not even sure where to start, look for rotational internship programs, look for a company who at least aligns with your mission and values. Cause at least like if that company is willing to invest in you and you also see like um, ROI return on investment with being at the company, I think it's always like a great learning opportunity. And the fun thing about careers, especially nowadays, you're allowed to switch careers every two years, three years, like it's, you're not, shackled to like one company forever you're allowed to explore different things try different things and it's totally okay and yeah that is uh how I got to where I am now and now I'm at it I started my new company two months ago and if anyone ever wants to talk about the transition from a first job to a to a second one let me know I am here for you if you need any advice yeah that was absolutely beautiful gang I loved that thank you and thank no thank all of you because I think um, it's important, all the things that y'all just said, um, especially putting yourself out there, being okay with the unknown and transitioning and just going after it. I think it's very important, especially because I don't know about y'all, but the pandemic taught me a lot about needing to pivot and the importance of flexibility because you have no idea what's going to happen next. Um, similar to Melanie, I graduated, you know, I, after changing my major and completely doing something different from what I thought I was going to do in undergrad. Uh, I took some extra time in college to finally do what I wanted to study, only to not be met with the job market that my peers who graduated before me were met with and scrambling to find a job because everyone was shutting their doors. Like no one was 
you know, going to take that risk of hiring someone new because where's the money for it? We don't know what's going on. And so um, feeling, feeling, you know, very rejected, but it's important. All of these things that y'all have talked about, especially um, with knowing that, like, if that person, if a recruiter is not uh, specifically looking for, or if they don't really know of your major or what you can offer, they know someone who will, which does stress the importance of networking, which is something I learned, um, like, very early on once I switched to political science. Networking was the key to getting, you know, from getting to place to place. That's actually how I found my first job out of undergrad because I interned there previously. I stayed in touch with like my former uh, coworkers and they're the ones who referred me. And so um, I just, I appreciated and I loved hearing all of y'all's stories about how you got to where you were and how, um, especially now that we are, you know, the more we are, um, what's it called, staying away from, or not staying away, sorry. The more that we're removed from Virginia Tech, we're transitioning into second jobs and maybe third jobs and things on the side. Um, and so I appreciate that so much. So whoever's watching, y'all rewind that section, take some notes, take some very detailed notes on what to do. Um, and so another question that I wanted to ask is, Similar to what I asked before about your Asian American identity and undergrad, but this is more geared towards the workplace. So as an Asian American woman in the workplace, do you feel like your identity um, impacts your experiences? Um, does it influence how you're treated? Does, do you think it influences things like, you know, pay, leadership, so on and so forth, based on your personal experiences, if there are any? And if so, how do you advocate for yourself in the workplace? in the workspace. I can speak to this. Um, so a couple of things. I think there's so much I can say about this, but I was lucky for my first, I guess, full-time career to be a really pretty progressive company, I'd say. Um, they're like the culture that they cultivated was very and like a lot of DE, DEI was really ingrained within their culture. And I think parts of where I was excited was that they were like seeing a couple girlies that are like like me and like other people and they, like they had like especially being in recruiting and HR they had specific like demographics that they wanted to make sure that they were providing opportunities for underrepresented individuals within the tech space so actually seeing that being ingrained within the recruiting process and within HR I, I think I had a kind of I think it really just depends on the industry that you're in and um, as well as department times where I found frustrating as an Asian American woman in the workplace was volunteering my time to be part of the DEI committee and realizing that once that committee is or IND committee committee and seeing that once it's formed how like much work is put on me to explain myself to people like we had a great um lunch and learn with my whole entire organization talking about like stop Asian hate and it was like I got to do with my like a fellow like colleagues who are still my friends to this day and talking about things that I felt important about. Same with the CEO, like sharing, like reserving like a specific time within the day just to talk about things. And I think that was nice, creating a, cultivating that space. But I think at the end of the day, it really depends on that organization itself to actually want, like they have to ingrain it with themselves and they can't expect the people within marginalized groups to do all the work. And that was like the biggest thing as an Asian American woman in the workplace that I've seen. I've also seen things that we'll probably talk about. Uh, I can send a link, but pretty much women typically don't like really put themselves up for promotions compared to men in the workplace, especially in HR that I've seen. As I'm, I keep mentioning recruiting, but also like seeing the type of people who apply to jobs, um, women typically tend, or those who identify as like women um, typically tend to apply to jobs when they 100% meet all the qualifications. For specifically those in, who identify as men, it's like, if they meet like 30% of the thing, like of the job description, they're like, all right, I'm applying. So I say for everybody here, like, especially those who identify as um, women or are like um, femme, like just go for it. That's the main thing. But overall at the end of the day, like I think um, how to advocate for yourself, I would say be honest. And I think, especially when you're interviewing for your job process, to feel out 
the culture of the company actually fill out your manager and see if this is someone that you can actually trust as well as HR like because these are people who should be going to bat for you if anything were to happen and they are responsible for making sure that you have a safe environment it's kind of different because I guess I'm like more on the HR side of things but um yeah and I think that's it I'm trying to think of like how it I can advocate my, for myself, but what I'll do is I'll send this blog that we had someone actually speak in, I'll put it in the chat. So there's this great woman who came in to speak, um, all things on just like advocating for yourself, especially as a person of color um, in the workspace. So I'll put that there. Like I'll, literally everything I learned from her was like from all of her talks was last year and she does some free talks as well. So I'll put that free resource in there, but yeah. Anyone who wants to go next. I can go next. Okay. I can totally relate to Yang, actually. So when you were talking about like being in DEI or like, you know, joining a committee, you're okay. So also at ICF, we also have like committees um, and anyone can join. It's it's just kind of like a volunteer or it's almost like a student organization, which is really cool because um you know, coming out of college, you're like, oh, like, where's my social life? It's like, oh, you still have one, don't worry. As long as you put yourself out there and you have to sign up for these things and they're all free or whatever. Um, so I joined uh, my ICF DEI um, committee and I, I joined in for a call and actually the person running it, she messaged me on the side and was like, hey, like, can, can we, can I just talk to you? Like one-on-one, -on -one? like what you said was so great. I don't even remember what I said, but I just said something and like she, she really wanted to talk to me. And so um, after that, um, she wanted, um, so we actually have a podcast at ICF for, um, an internal podcast for, I guess, all of our ICFers. Um, and, uh, I think this upcoming one, um, I think she wants me to talk in one of them and it's only around eight to 10 minutes, but she wants me to talk about DEI and don't get me wrong. Like I'm totally honored, but Yang, I know what you mean by like, oh, anytime they need someone in DEI, that's Asian American, like. Oh, go to Yang. Oh, oh, go to Melanie. You know what I mean? Um, and that's not a bad thing necessarily. I like how obviously they mean well, right? But then I said, obviously, if I'm doing this, like we need, I need to see like results from it, right? So I was like, if I'm going to do this, like there better be more Asian Americans that get hired. There better be more Asian Americans that even get interviewed. You know what I mean? Things just like that. Um, and obviously, like I can't control, you know, like the whole recruiting side and things like that. But um, those are just like some of the things that I wanted to highlight. And um, obviously, like Yang, I'm probably going to be reading this blog and be like, oh, let me let me get some inspiration for this podcast. But um, <laughs> for sure, um, that is what I've noticed being an Asian American, especially on my team. Um, I'm also like my team, we are fairly small, so I, I can't blame them for not having a huge, like, you know, diverse group. But um, I am like the only Asian American on my team. But I will say like our intern that we just brought in, um, halfway after halfway through the year from when I started working. Um, she's also like, uh, she's um, an African-American. And so I was like, oh, like, hey, like at least I think I'm seeing, you know, the change. Um, and obviously you can't hire like 20 people at once like that. But I think within my team, I think there are um, changes that are being made. And then ICF um, or not ICF. So I work on a utility specifically um, for a Southern Maryland utility. And whenever, um, we so in marketing obviously there is i guess audience targeting and so um when when i do do that like i have to look into the demographics and all of the you know socioeconomic like communities and things like that and so um usually whenever we need to do research on that it usually goes to me but i am like trying to you know advocate for other people to do it too so they are aware and they are knowledgeable about like other people and the other experiences that whoever we're targeting also have Elaine, do you have anything? If not, that's completely fine too. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. Um, I'd say my experience is very different. Um, uh, being in the construction industry, I think it's very, like it's a, it's, it's hard to explain it unless you're in it, but um, it can be a, like a really rough environment as, like, cause it's a combination of project management and the field team getting together. And it can be a very casual environment, um, to say the least. And um, I guess like navigating through that as an Asian American woman, um, I admit like it's kind of more obvious that people are trying to be careful what they're saying to me or like, um, or it's like sometimes they will be blatant about what they want to say to me. And 
like it'll, the tagline will be like, oh, don't tell HR, by the way. And it's like, um, yeah, so how I guess how I stick up for myself, not gonna lie, sometimes I like, I can be a little bit like I will speak up like on the spot. It's like, hey, don't don't say that to me, please. Like I I'm literally on this team with you till next year. Like don't like we we can't talk like this to me. And um, it can be rough and it's just weird. <laughs> and I guess like to the people that are careful of what they say to me, it it it's appreciated that they are thinking but um, I guess it is extremely awkward when it's just not said correctly. And sometimes like, even though it can be exhausting as a minority to like have to explain like why what you said is wrong or it's like why what you said makes me uncomfortable. Um, it's like who else will say it to them or they're just gonna go through like the next few months with me like, like feeling like they have to talk like feeling they have to walk on eggshells around me. So I guess like, because it's, um, I'm sorry if I'm not explaining enough, but like uh, there's really not a lot of Asian Americans, Asian Americans, Asian American women in the construction industry. So it's it's very unique. Um, like, um, I guess having to deal with the people that I'm surrounded with and it's not and it's like I am in an in-person environment so it's um it's something that like I have to deal with like more 40 to 40 plus hours each week um I hope it doesn't sound like I'm complaining but it, it's just it's a real thing in my industry um they like having to deal with people like who either have no, no filter like most of the time or people it's like oh they're they're really unsure of what to say to me because they're so used to like not having a filter around everyone else um but yeah I don't I don't know if that made sense because like it's a very niche experience but yeah oh that, that totally that totally made sense and I appreciate all of you sharing your and also attest to being part of a DEI committee myself in a previous job but I think something that I noticed that is common um, with all of us is that we again have had the burden of needing to well it's you know like I don't want to say it's like it's not a burden per se I know I just like misspoke I oh uh-oh my internet is unstable can everyone hear me now yeah we can okay, hear you now sorry. we, we it, missed it, yeah <laughs> oh, okay so um what I was saying is um you know, sometimes we are tasked with the job of, um, uh, with, you know, it, teaching everyone. And as someone who actually thoroughly enjoys doing that kind of stuff, because I know that was like part of my previous job when I was working at the A Center, like I love that. You could only remind someone so many times, you know, to do this and to do that. And so I don't want to say, you know, I would like to retract what I said about teaching being a burden. It's not that it's a burden. It just because it starts to feel that way when it feels like you are talking to a brick wall or that you constantly, you know, you're automatically defaulted to. And so, um, but I appreciate y'all saying that, you know, you need to stand up for yourself and that you need to be more vocal and say, hey, don't speak to me this way or hey, that is not okay. I think also something that would be good would be to find a mentor if possible within your field. Um, because that's what I have found with, um, with my current job, all of my coworkers in my office, were all women. Uh, and a lot of them are a lot older than I am. And they have taken me under their wing and they've shown me like, Hey, this is how you advocate for yourself. Hey, this is how you address someone so that they don't ignore your emails or, you know, kind of, um, push you to the side and it's helped a lot because they advocate they even advocate for me sometimes when I'm too afraid to do it myself so you know just adding my own two cents finding a mentor makes the whole world of a difference um in the ways that you know if you aren't super comfortable with speaking up for yourself you get to learn from the side from someone who has gone through it before um and so 
the this is the last question and so you know just tying this all up together I know there was a lot of good advice earlier and just actually sprinkled throughout this entire Q&A session which I absolutely love um but my last question to you all is what advice do you have for students looking for a job or an internship the big one the whole reason why we've had this <laughs> not the whole reason but I know it's a big one especially you know spring is we're in spring I'm sure people are looking for jobs and internships that they haven't already so um what would y'all like to if you have to you know give one piece of advice or more if you'd like what would you like to give them I guess one thing that I will say is like asking for help is not a sign of weakness um I know that's cliche but it it is kind of ridiculous to me how often um, I run into people who are so, like are so stubborn and they will definitely try to take on everything themselves and um, but I feel like you're not you're you're kind of putting yourself in a pigeonhole of like opportunities when you don't ask for help because it, it just feels so much more open talking to people and um, asking them what their take is on something or um, or I guess like like what, ad, what advice do they have? Or maybe they've been in a similar experience that you've been in. So I'd say asking for help, even if they don't know what to do, like with what you're asking of them, at least like you're getting that that different perspective um, to make you, to challenge you to think more. So yeah, I don't think asking for help is a weakness. I think it's, I think it's a good challenge for yourself, so yeah. Am I supposed to call on someone? Um, <laughs> I guess Yang, I choose you. Thank you. Um, let's see. As someone who has done many interviews and also has given many interviews to people, I definitely would say interviewing is always a two-way street. Easier said than done. Like I still, even before this panel, get nervous to speak in front of people or just sometimes people in general, I just psych myself out. But for before each interview, if you can, before just take three really deep breaths and inhale and exhale them out. And then just remember at the end of the day, this is just a conversation just to see if this is a good fit for you. But hopefully it'll help settle any nerves because that's what I do. Even when I was interviewing people, I get so nervous for some reason. I'm like, wait, I'm on the other side of things now. But yeah, like my main thing is just treat it like a conversation. You're, you're really trying to make sure that this is a great fit for you. Like I know, like as someone who is really desperate looking for jobs, like I think um, what I realized was like, you know, like I need to make sure that I'm intentionally applying to companies that actually like I want to work for. Because I used to be the person that sees like LinkedIn or Indeed, like easy apply, say less. I'm just going to like easy apply my way through things. And that's how I got to the number of like rejection <laughs> emails that I did do. Um, but there are really good recruiters out there and recruiters who do care about you as a person. And if you find them, those are people who you want to like those are the companies you want to work for because then they're going to invest in you. So definitely do that. And if you can, like what I, my trick that I always do is like people like love talking about themselves sometimes. So like I just interview the interviewer back. Like I would like look up on their LinkedIn and I ask them specific questions. Like for example, if this person worked at like an XYZ company, but they transitioned to this cur the current company that I'm interviewing for, I'd be like, hey, well, how was that transition like? And they would be like, well, like they actually took the time to like research me on LinkedIn. And if, and if they're not there, feel free to just ask generic questions of like how has like your experience been but not just there just take it to the next level of like um how do you see yourself growing in this in this organization how do you how do you like how, what has like leadership done to address any like changes that employees um recommend and so on things like that like that can get you a better gist of like if this is like an actual environment that you feel that you want to grow in i had another thought now <laughs> went away but it was pretty much yeah just doing all of that and yeah i can't remember now but it was yeah just treat it like a two conversation and at the end of the day like oh i remember now if you ever feel like you didn't do well in an interview feel free at the end just be like hey like do you have any just as an interview do you have any feedback about like our conversation and so another good one is one that um intern candidates have asked me before is like is there anything from this conversation or my resume that would um, make you feel hesitant on moving me forward to the next round? That really makes the interviewer think, 
like that made me stop in my tracks and be like, wait a minute, that was a good question. So if anyone <laughs> needs like ever needs like interview help or anything, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I have a couple in my pocket and yeah. So I think the more, more practice you get with doing those things, it feels better. Cause I think sadly throughout our whole life, we'll just have to continue going through interviews in order to get the job that we want, no matter what, it, what job it is. And same thing goes for networking. Treat interviews like conversations. And if it doesn't work out, treat them as networking opportunities, add them on LinkedIn. So then you have that person to reach back out to again, and again in the future. And that is my whole spiel on things. Thanks, Melanie. I am literally writing down your, your like advice. <laughs> if anyone wants it, I'm gonna put it in the chat right after this. But honestly, also what Yang was saying about just like all these questions that she just, she just literally gave us like three or four examples. I feel like I'm assuming Yang that it, it like sets you apart. Like it, it makes you more unique and you're more memorable. And obviously when the recruiter is going through your resume, they'll be like, oh, like this person, I remember like they asked blah, blah, blah. So yeah, I was going to say like, um, like I said, I already said this already, but like putting yourself out there. And when I say that, not I'm not talking about just career fairs, like even this um, recording right now, I don't know who is watching this and I don't know when you're going to watch this, but whenever you watch this, like, please reach out to us. Like, um, I know like it might be like nerve wracking. Like it's like, oh, like they're like older and like we're so experienced and stuff. But literally like this is literally Yang's job. <laughs> like She wants to talk to you. And like me as a marketing major, I don't know if you could tell, but I like talking. And so like just getting to know um, you guys as undergrads and like being able to relate and even just talking about Virginia Tech, like, oh, like is the, is this dining hall still there? Like, well, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just things like that. Um, and just, we have that connection already that we're both Hokies. And so like that already makes it so easy for us to like have a starting point and then going from there. I would hope, I would like to think most people liked their experience at Virginia Tech. So they'll love talking about it. Um, and so just literally reaching out to us on LinkedIn, we'll probably, you know, provide you guys our, our emails or whatever later on, but please, please reach out. And even if you're watching this, like this is four months later. Oh, now I finally got to this podcast or like, what is this, this, this Q and A, right? totally fine literally if you're like hi I just saw hi Melody like I just saw this interview like uh literally kind of late I literally won't care be like oh my gosh now that now that you remind me I remember doing this and so literally just reach out even if you see this a year in it like a year from now because we we want to be there and we want to talk to you guys and we like it and like like Yang saying we like talking about ourselves too so um, definitely put yourself out there. I did that um, when I was an undergrad and I think for the most part, it made a difference, but it's also like keeping that conversation going too. Um, obviously the first, like the first step is you reaching out to us because we don't know who you guys are obviously, right? But like, please reach out to us and hopefully if the conversation goes well, like it will lead, you know, somewhere. And during COVID, I reached out to all my alumni friends. They helped me out as best as they could and I can, I can be more thankful, so. Yeah, that is my advice to all you undergrads <laughs> or all thank you students. You all. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Thank you all so much. Uh, I uh, had a quick uh, scene change because my this happened at last year's panel too. My MacBook said it was going to die in a few minutes if I didn't uh, plug it in. So tradition, I'm sticking with it. Um, thank you all so much. Um, and, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't add a little uh, if I didn't add my own two cents, but um, as everyone has said before, Virginia Tech has a very expansive alumni network, whether it's through, shameless plug-in, Pokey Mentorship Connect, <laughs> LinkedIn, even, you know, um, if indeed, you're, if you're looking at these jobs and you see someone who has that job position on LinkedIn or, you know, hearing it through networks, I highly encourage you all to tap into this very expansive network and ever-growing network of alums um, because they are more than willing to help and it never hurts to ask, you know? Um, the worst thing that someone can say is no, um, but there are a bunch of other people who are more than willing to say yes, including these wonder wonderful people right here who are on this panel. Um, so um, with that uh, being said, um, in addition to uh, in addition to what's it called, networking uh, and connecting to other alums, remember as you're going through this career process, whether it's looking for a job or an internship, 
a lot of it does work out. It may not feel that way in the moment, but take a deep breath because it will. If, I man if we manage to find a job in a pandemic or <laughs> whatever else, you know, um, anything and everything can happen, including really good things. You just have to be open to it. Um, so don't panic, don't stress. There are plenty of opportunities out there. Um, and before we open up um, the question uh, real quick, um, so again, this is hosted by the Asian Cultural Engagement Center and the PETAs. So if you have a moment to check us out on social media, we have Instagram, we have, I don't remember if the A Center still has Twitter, uh, but APITAS has Twitter. Um, we will share our social media handles and we also have our corresponding listserv. If you are um, an alum who happens to stumble upon this, uh, or if you are soon to be alum, if you're gonna be graduating soon, please uh, connect with APITAS. We are more than happy to take you in. Uh, that way we can get you connected with other alums and you get to participate in experiences like this. Um, so that is all that we have. Is there any specific questions from anyone? Oops. From Jane, for those who consider themselves introverted, what are your tips for networking? Does anyone want to take a stab at that? I feel like I'm not, <laughs> I can't, I can't answer this because I am an extrovert. I will admit, like, I'm not going to deny that. But I will say, um, after college, um, I, I took the MBTI test again. Obviously, some people say it's not accurate. Some people say it is. But um, I've um, become more introverted since graduating. And I think COVID was part of that. Um, but um, I think tips for networking, um, even if you're introverted, I, I don't think it hurts to send someone a LinkedIn message um, online. And obviously, like you can connect with anyone. And I think it's also easier when it's online rather than in person. I think that's just um, for the most part. But also, if you have that COVID or not the COVID fatigue, but um, the Zoom fatigue and things like that, like totally understandable, too. But um, I think just sending out an email or, or you know, just this sending a quick message. It literally has to be like two sentences. Um, just, hi, I'm blah, blah, blah. And I'm interested in what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. Can you help me? You know, just a little message like that um, could go a long way. So that's what I'll say. If it's future in-person events, oh, sorry, Lenny. Um, definitely bring a buddy. Like do like grab a buddy and go with them and just feed off of each other's energy and just say, hey, this is this, this is, we're in this industry and we're looking to X, Y, Z thing. And hopefully that makes things a little bit easier to have a friend with you. I'm with Melanie, just emailing and LinkedIn, LinkedIn, in, in, whatever, whatever, if that is a term, um, just messaging people on LinkedIn, like, hey, like I see you're an alumni or I had a couple of emails or not emails, but messages from um, a former or current like BSA or FASA people saying like, hey, like I'm in, I'm X, Y, Z person in this org and like I see you were also in it and I wanted to know your experience. So you can start off there or, or even start off with anyone in your family in your, or in your internet, like immediate community and just say, hey, I'm interested in this. Do you mind introducing me to this person? Um, like, especially if they, these are people who like care about you and hopefully they would because they would want to see you succeed, but just reach out to a friend or like some, one of your family members and just like, hey, can you introduce me to someone who you know of in this field and maybe they can just introduce me to another person, another person just to slowly expand. So I'll say that and I'll pop going back to the link. Thank you. Yes, yeah, my bad. I meant to I meant to say something because the introverted part caught my attention. Um yeah I was I was trying to think of how to best answer this. Um I'd say like speaking from like an introverted standpoint, I think for me um, I definitely, when it comes to group friendships versus like one-on-one -on -one friendships, I do value the one-on-one -on -one interaction so much more. Um, and how I network with that is I try to make each interaction with each person as genuine as possible. Like I try not to let the introversion like stop me from being, um, for stop them stop me from letting this person like see how like how much I really care how much I really am um I guess like an experience that I've gotten from prep putting that into practice was um 
for my company, Grunly, um, when I was in, when I was working my way towards like the final round of interviews, um, I did ask, so the person interviewing me, I didn't meet up with her again until I moved on to this project. And I was like, hey, Danielle, like, what was, what was your impression of me? Like when you met me and like, she remembers that she interviewed me and stuff. And I was like, I should have asked you this when you were interviewing me, but I'm, I'm curious, like, what, what did you think? And she's like, Elaine, you're literally one of the most genuine ones that I met in the entire process. And even though you, she knew I lacked the experience <laughs> when, when I was being interviewed, like I had zero zero experience in the construction industry I was not doing well in the technical interview but um she was saying like I pushed that you got hired because you were you were the easiest to talk to like you didn't just throw words at me telling me like everything you've done like you genuinely you genuinely showed me that you wanted to do this like rather than like oh I can do this it's like no I want to do this and I'd say that's like my tip for networking as someone who doesn't really reveal themselves um, that easily. So yeah, I hope that helped. Um, people are not gonna believe this, but I am more introverted than extroverted. Uh, it took a lot of training at Virginia Tech to become as extroverted as I am now. Uh, but I will say, um, similar, um, kind of on the same vein as uh, what Elaine just mentioned, um, asking questions, like if you don't know what to say or how to sell yourself, start with, well, take some time on your own and think about really great things about you. And it helps a lot because this is like, these are the positive things about me. These are the things that make me unique. Um, and how can I sell that? But if you find yourself kind of unable in a situation, if you're networking with someone and you find yourself unable to talk more about yourself, your qualifications, or, um, give your elevator pitch, for example. I've noticed, and um, Yang mentioned this before, people love talking about themselves. Ask questions, start asking questions and they'll keep going. And next thing you know, like this person has been talking more than you, but you seem engaged. You seem like you know exactly what you want, what you're doing, but you're so interested in what that other person has to say. And they're enthralled with you. Why? Because you let them talk about themselves and you have to do very little effort. I know that sounds like I'm not telling you to cut corners, I'm just saying. Like you allow this person to talk a lot and then it's like, oh, we have this connection. We have this bond because, you know, you're getting to learn more about them and we'll pick up tidbits from that conversation. Like, oh, you did this club when you were at Virginia Tech, I did this club. Or, you know, you lived in this dorm, I lived in that dorm. You know, it, it, it's like small things. And then it kind of allows you to build off of their energy. And most likely when you're networking, you're talking to someone who, you want their kind of job, you want their kind of position. So they're gonna be well-versed anyways. So when in doubt, always ask questions and then you can build from there. Um, that's just, that's something I've done in my personal experience because sometimes I find it very difficult to talk about myself and I will have my introverted moments. But when you're able to build off of that energy, it does wonders and you've done very little to no work. <laughs> does anyone else have any other questions? You can unmute yourself and just, shout it out you don't have to type it but um no problem jane um does anyone have any other questions or anything comments yeah, dr ha said show curiosity it's very important <laughs> yeah show that you want to learn like elaine said <laughs> and again if anyone has any other questions um, because again, like if, if you don't think of it now, or if you're watching this later on, um, feel free to contact any of us and we're more than happy to answer any specific questions or concerns that you have. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm going to stop recording now. If that's okay. <laughs>